Okay, um, so today I'm going to finish talking about bumper cars, which is the last piece of the class that, that's the same as Physics 1050. And then we'll head off into doing the world of electricity, specifically static electricity. So, so it's, uh, it's a little schizophrenic today, but we'll do it anyway. Where I, where I left off last time talking about bumper cars was, was with the new conserved quantity called momentum. So the first, one, first conserved quantity we encountered was energy, which I call the, the conserved quantity of doing things. It's not about moving. It's about being able to finally to do work so you, so you can uh, affect things around you. And it, again, it has no direction. Momentum is different. Momentum is the conserved quantity of, of moving, of going somewhere. And it does have a direction. And it's all about motion. If you've got momentum, you can't help but move with it. Furthermore, you can't move without momentum. They go hand in hand. And where, where, what I was trying to show you last time was that, that it's something that momentum is a conserved quantity that, that you obtain from other things around you. Because of course, you can't create it. It's conserved. So you get it from something, you carry it with you, and then you pass it off to other things. While you're just simply carrying it with you, that's what you're carrying. You're not carrying force. So, so just to emphasize that, as, as, although it's common, common language, people talk about carrying force. I, I'm full of force or something. I, you know, that's not true. You, you carry the conserved quantity with you, but you obtain it and pass it to something else by way of force. So in order to, in order to pass along your momentum, you have to push on something. And you have to push on it for time. And the, and the transfer of momentum that you, that you do by, by way of the, this process, this process which is known as an impulse, the amount of momentum you transfer is the force you exert times the time you exert it. All right? So a, a key piece of this that I want to, to do, and I, I'm just going to animate this, human animate it, basically. If I'm carrying momentum with me, which I'm not yet, and I pass it to something, Interestingly enough, I can pass more momentum to the something that I'm carrying with me, in which case I run a deficit. And here's the, so here's the story. I, I'm going to obtain some rightward momentum from the floor. So there, I've got it. I'm, now I'm carrying it with me. And in the absence of friction, I would carry it easily. And now I'm going to give it to the wall. OK, I gave every bit of my rightward momentum to the wall by way of an impulse. I exerted a, for, a rightward force on the wall for a period of time. And I, and I went from 10 units, say, of rightward momentum to zero. I can actually transfer more than that. So I'm going to do it again. And th this time, I'm going to transfer 20 units of rightward momentum to the wall. Watch what happens. So I'm going to get some rightward momentum out of the floor. Off I go. And now I'm going to transfer 10 units, and then 10 units again. Whoa! I, I bounced. In the act of bouncing, I gave it not only all my rightward momentum, but Yet again, some rightward momentum. I end up with a deficit of rightward momentum, which is leftward momentum. And I'll give it to the wall and stop. So you know, why would that matter? You know, one, one of my favorite kind of exam questions is the, uh, our, our, when you go to a state fair or a county fair or something like that, and there are various ways you can win prizes. And most of those the games are rigged against you by physics. There's, there's a physics reason why it's extremely hard to win. For example, they'll, to knock over milk jugs, they'll have piled up very massive milk jugs. They're not full of milk, they're full of lead or something. And you've got to knock them over. And, they, and they'll, they might give you bean bags to knock them over. So you give a bean bag, this is essentially a bean bag, you give it all huge, as much momentum as you can give it, and it hits, and it it, it doesn't bounce, and I, I try to find a real beanbag. It would hit and just drop, having transferred every bit of its momentum to the milk jug. It turns out you can do better. If they, if they were, would give you a bouncy ball and it hits, as it, in the act of rebounding, it transfers yet more momentum to the milk jug, and it actually will knock it over better. So if you want to knock something over, don't hit and stop. Hit and jump backwards, because you transfer, you transfer 
all your momentum in the process of coming to a stop, and you transfer still more momentum in this original direction by leaping backwards, rebounding. Is that okay? So, uh, what else do I want to say about momentum? It is the real reason why an object that's free of external forces moves at constant velocity. That Newton's first law, remember the way back day one, essentially. Why, is, you know, why Newton's first law? It's because when you're carrying momentum, or, or have none, when you're carrying momentum, you, and nothing pushes on you, nothing is going to do an impulse on you, one way or the other. Whatever momentum you started the story with, you're going to end the story with. You've got no choice. And the momentum you're carrying turns out to be your mass times your velocity. It just, that, that's, how, that's what momentum, the momentum of a simple object, that's what it is. The object's mass times its velocity. And since the object can't change its mass, you can't change your mass, since you've got a fixed momentum and a fixed mass, your velocity's fixed, unchangeable in the absence of impulses. All right? Um, just to play with an air hockey table, which is sort of you know, the, the <laughs> poor man's version of, a, of, a, of bumper cars. You can see that when two bumper cars bump, so this, it's an air table, so I've got relatively little friction here. If one bumper car is sitting still and the other one comes up and hits it, as in the game of billiards and stuff, they hit squarely. One the one that was moving comes to perfect stop, and the one that wasn't moving sort of continues the motion. They have transferred the motion perfectly. That's possible if the two cars are identical, the two balls are identical. The reason being that not only are they transferring momentum, they're also transferring energy. And when, they're, when they have the same mass, they can perfectly, the, 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 the colliding car hitting the stationary one can perfectly transfer every bit of its energy and every bit of its momentum to the other car and off they go. If they differ in mass, which is part of the fun of bumper cars, a little, you know, little, little car, big car, and of course this one's stopped, it's, it's, it's thicker, this is a cheat. Okay, this, this guy's definitely little. That guy rebounded, it bounced backwards. It couldn't give, in, in, in trying to transfer all of its energy and all of its momentum from this one to this one, it couldn't do that. It turns out the relationships between energy and momentum are different enough that if they differ in mass, this one can't carry away all of this one's energy and all of this one's momentum. They won't add up properly. So you have to have more complicated uh, impacts. Like, for example, this, the little one rebounding in part. It actually gave more momentum than it had to the, to the big one and rebounded. So bounces like that, I don't want to dwell on it because I want to get on other parts of the, of the class. But in summary, the thing is, in the game of bumper cars, as with other games like air hockey and billiards, you're transferring both energy and momentum all the time. And the, the, the results of, of collisions, how things bounce off each other, is, is dominated by the need to deal with these two conserved quantities, energy and momentum. And not to, you know, obviously you can't destroy one or create one. Uh, you gotta, they gotta be handled properly. And so that, that dictates how the balances work. All right? Kind of want to leave it at that and go on to the other conserved quantity in, in, in bumper cars and in life in general. The other conserved quantity of motion, which is angular momentum. So that it's, this is very similar to momentum in the sense that it's, it's about motion. And if you've got angular momentum, you've got to move. But it's rotational in, in nature. So to show you angular momentum, I, I don't want to translate around the room. I just want to be somewhere. So, so I'm going to sit on the swivel chair. And the swivel chair rotationally has very little friction. It's kind of like standing on the cart I stood on last time, which had very little uh, translational friction. So I can sort of show you, I can carry momentum with me. On the swivel chair, I can carry angular momentum with me. So once I take my feet off the floor, I, I, I can't get any torques on me 
And it turns out that torques are the way in which you transfer angular momentum. I, my angular momentum is stuck. Whatever I've got is what I've got within, within the limits of the of perfection of the, of the, you know, the friction freeness of this swivel chair. So right now I have no angular momentum. To, to start rotating, to have some angular momentum, I'm turning a little bit here because it's just not perfect. I need to get some angular momentum from something. How do I get it? I exert a torque on something for time and it exerts a torque on me for time. I'm going to exert a torque on the floor. So I, I, I'm going to twist the floor, it's going to twist me back and whoof, I've got angular momentum. And I can't stop turning until I get rid of that angular momentum. It's stuck. And so this is the origin of the Newton's first law of rotational motion. If you've got angular momentum, you know you've got to turn. All right? To stop turning, I have to give the angular momentum away. I give it to the floor. All right? Well, it's not very, very, uh, it doesn't prove much uh, just by, by doing that. Let me exchange angular momentum with something else. I didn't do exchanging momentum with other things. I said maybe uh, these, these uh, hockey pucks. Um, but I'm going to actually exchange angular momentum between myself and another object. And the other object is going to be a bicycle wheel. So I'm going to pack this bicycle wheel full of angular momentum. And on that swivel chair, the only angular momentum we'll be able to see is angular momentum about a vertical axis, up and down angular momentum. It, it, it doesn't allow me full pivoting. If, if I got one of those crazy gyms that you see sometimes at a fair, too, where you can, you can pivot about any, any ang angle, any axis, you know, great. It's, it's probably a lesson in how to throw up. But this guy will only allow me to show you angular momentum effects vertically, up or down. This is up, that's down. I'm going to exchange angular momentum between myself and the bicycle wheel, and we'll, we'll start a story with, with a certain amount of angular momentum in the vertical direction, namely zero, and then I'm going to exchange it I'm going to give some angular momentum up to the wheel, and it will give me some angular momentum down in return. So our sum is zero. We'll start with zero. We'll always have zero because it's a conserved quantity. So let me get this guy spinning. And this is one of the demonstrations that I really suggest you come and try. We've got a smaller bicycle wheel for people with short arms. It's really wobbling. I'm not sure why the wobble, but not pleasant. Okay, so I'm, we got no angular momentum vertically. I'm not rotating vertically, it's not rotating vertically, but if I pivot it, it is now rotating down. It has downward angular momentum, and I have upward angular momentum. Now we're back to zero, zero and zero. Now I have, it has upward angular momentum, I have downward angular momentum. And why, why it's fun to try this is because we fight each other. It twists me as I twist it. I, you know, this is hard to do, the to flip over. Like, ah, that's hard. And if you are a satellite and you want to change the orientation, your orientation or you're in a spaceship, this is how you do it. So the satellites, a lot of them have these spinning wheels in them, which, which they use to change their orientation, taking advantage of the conservation of angular momentum. Okay? So angular momentum is a real conserved quantity, very much like momentum, but there is one other uh, important difference. For, for ordinary momentum, as a you know, person going along, my, my, my ordinary momentum is my mass times my velocity. So if I'm carrying a certain amount of momentum I, and I can't change my mass, my velocity is stuck. If I'm pivoting, then my angular momentum is my rotational mass times my angular velocity. And if nothing's twisting me, my angular momentum is stuck. So the product of my rotational mass times my angular velocity is stuck. But I can't, I can change my rotational mass. I can change my shape. So if I pull my arms in, for example, and shrink my rotational mass, and my angular momentum is, is fixed because I'm isolated, then I've decreased my rotational mass, my angular velocity has to increase to compensate because the product of the two is my rotational, uh, 
angular momentum, and that's the fixed quantity. This is the reason why Newton's first law of rotational motion has some extra words in it. Rigid object. If the object can change shape while it's spinning, it will change its rotational speed, its angular velocity. And this is the, th this, I mean, I hope that, that's following. If it's not, ask me. Qu question? Okay. When I got started here before, I didn't worry about my shape. But if I, I'll get some angular momentum out of the floor while I have a large rotational mass. I'll be out like this. That means that I will be turning at a, at a low velocity, low angular velocity, and yet I'll have a lot of angular momentum because I have a big rotational mass times a modest angular velocity is a lot of uh, angular momentum. I'll then, I'll then shrink my rotational mass while, my, while I can't, well my angular momentum doesn't change, and I'll have to spin faster to compensate because the product of the two individual physical quantities, my rotational mass times my angular velocity, that, that has to stay constant. That's the angular momentum. So here we go. I'm, I just got some angular momentum out of the floor. And now, when I shrink my rotational mass, my angular velocity increases to compensate. So this is the, you know, the skater trick. How do you get, so you spin like crazy, start wide, get, start turning at a modest speed while you're, while you're out wide with, with a big rotational mass, and then shrink your rotational mass. All right? And based on that, I can now can ask you one of these questions, just for fun. If you get a playground merry-go-round, one, one of those discs with, with handles that you can get spinning, and you, cl you climb on it and have somebody push it and start spinning it around, then you, then you let, have everybody leave it alone. Now you, again, have conserved angular momentum. The, the angular momentum that you and the, and the, the merry-go-round have can't change. But what happens if you climb to the center of the merry-go-round? What happens to the, to the speed with which it's rotating? You okay with the question? Go for it. All right, I'll give you to, to, to 25 seconds. Most of you are done here. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. Sure enough, it will spin faster. So climbing to that center of that merry-go-round is, is basically doing the skater trick, and you'll go spin around faster and faster. And this affects things that, uh, systems that change shape. I mean, uh, the classic example is, is spinning pizza dough. So as you, as you spin pizza dough and it gets wider and wider, its rotation slows down in, in midair because it's increasing its rotational mass as it gets wider, and therefore it has to have a smaller angular velocity in order for it to keep the same constant angular momentum. All right. Anything else I want to just say? Um, about, about the transfers of, the anger, of normal momentum, momentum and anger momentum. What's called an impulse and an anger impulse. In impulses, where you, where you convey momentum to something else, you do it by way of a force for a period of time, and it's the product of the two that matters. With, with anger momentum, it's, it's a torque for time, and it's the product of the two that matters. The, the, the point of what I'm trying to say at this moment is that you can transfer all of your momentum or, or whatever certain amount you want to transfer different ways. You can use different relationships between force, force and time. You can use a big force for a little time, a little force for a big time, medium and medium. It's up to you. And so we do this routinely. I, I told you last time that if, if it's you that's transferring the momentum, like your, like your forehead, you typically want to do this by way of a small force for a long time. It feels better. 
I mean, if you're playing soccer, I guess, and you've got to get the ball to go from heading toward you to heading away from you, you're going to have to transfer momentum very quickly. It's going to be a big force for a little time, and that may not feel so good. I mean, I, I, it's unfathomable to me that people do it, but okay, they do it. Um, this is how a hammer works. It transfers all its momentum to a nail by way of an enormous force for a very short period of time. It's a force so large that it causes the nail to get shoved into a piece of wood or an ax into a, into a log, same idea. Okay, um, public service announcement part of this is like modern cars are designed to slow down the momentum transfer of you to the world around you. If your car hits something that's not moving and, it's, and it will not move like a tree or a bridge embankment or something like that, you're gonna lose all your momentum. It is, there, something's gonna take it out of you because you're gonna come to a stop with the car. But what you much prefer to do is come to a stop gradually by way of small forces for long periods of time. You want to hit the airbag, not the steering wheel. You want your car to crumple as it hits and deliberately slow down the process of bringing you to a stop. So you transfer your momentum to the car slowly and from the car to whatever it hits slowly. So moder um, say, uh, road work vehicles, they have those big, uh, boxes, it looks like, hanging off the back of the road work vehicle. What is that to do? It's if somebody hits the road work vehicle with their car, this is a huge marshmallow, basically, that slows the incoming vehicle to a stop gradually by way of a small force for a long time. But it all, it's consistent over and over again. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yes. Can you transfer more angular momentum than you have? Yes, I was doing it actually. I was starting with zero, and I would give the, the wheel some upward angular momentum, and I would get downward angular momentum in return. I would give away angular momentum I did not have. And so now suddenly I've got downward angular momentum. And then I flip it over, I would give it all my downward momentum, and then more than I had. And I would end up with upward momentum, and it would have downward momentum. So it happens all the time. Other questions like that? There's a question that came about the, the, the airbags again, uh, momentum. In the old days, you know, when I was, when I was <laughs> my granddaughter's novice age, the cars did not have airbags. And during an accident, you would come to a stop on whatever you hit. Because without a, a force, you're not gonna, uh, you, won't, you can't give away your, your momentum. So you have, to, you have to be pushed on by something. What was there to, for the driver to, to be pushed on by, well, the steering wheel. Bad news, because it would transfer, you would transfer all your momentum to the steering wheel by way of a huge force for a short period of time and it would not be good. So the idea of the airbag is to pop up basically a marshmallow in front of you so that you come to a stop over a much longer period of time. And the airbag is designed to give. It does, it, you don't want to actually bounce off of it. It's not, it doesn't blow up like a balloon that, that then you, you hit and then you rebound. That's not good because you want to give away all your momentum. You don't want to end up with momentum backwards. Don't, don't have it give you more than you had. Bring, it, bring you to a total rest. And so you basically want to squish it flat and then, we're, then you're done. Uh, no rebound. That's the ideal. Other questions? All right. So that's you know, the world of bumper cars and, and hitting each other. This is just a last note is why are bumper cars, why do they have a rubber bumper? Why not just a steel bumper? You, you, you've seen steel marbles bouncing on concrete. They bounce pretty well. So you could have bumper cars that just have steel rims hitting each other. It's the momentum transfers would be too fast. By way of huge forces, it would be very uncomfortable uh, riding those bumper cars. So they, they slow down the momentum transfers deliberately. So it, you, know, you, you come out with your tongue still intact. Don't bite it off. All right, now for something completely different. And that is static electricity, which we always hit somewhere sort of in the, in the winter. It's not particularly cold right now, but, but uh, on really cold days when there's very little moisture in the air, static electricity is particularly present. You, know, you, you notice it. Uh, the moisture in the air tends to, to 
dissipates that electricity so you don't get the, the good sparks as you get on, win on cold winter days when there's not much moisture in the air. So what's the story with static electricity? Um, let me start with a, one, with a question here, too. Got that one there. So it's, it, there's no real reason why you would know the answer to this one at this point. But a girl rubs her feet on the carpet and gives her twin a shock. So, that, so, so we've got, we got two identical girls. And in the first part of the story, the, the one, only one girl sort of walks across the carpet, gives the other one a shock. You, you've probably experienced this kind of situation. What if both of the girls rub their feet across the carpet? So they're doing exactly the same thing. They have exactly the same history. And then they reach out to touch each other. What's the shock going to be like? You OK with the question? More questions on the question? See what you, see what you think. We'll go to 25 seconds and then call it. Three, two, one, zero. Uh, it, it was early on, B was winning big, and then uh, A and C sort of caught up. It's actually B is the answer. And to give you an idea where this is, where this is uh, why and where we're going is, in the first story, where, where only one girl managed to accumulate static electric charge and the other girl didn't, the reaching out and almost touching allowed the char electric charge that was on the girl who had rubbed her feet across the carpet to spread out. One girl had charge on her, the other didn't, and charge, it turns out, likes to spread out for reasons we'll see. And it leaped across as a, as a shock to the second girl so that it could be 50% be on the first girl, 50% on the second girl. In the second story, where they both rubbed their, their feet along, they both accumulated static electric charge. And there was no opportunity for the charge to spread out any further. It was already evenly distributed on the two girls, so why bother doing anything further? And it didn't. So that's the basic idea. But, but the story I have to tell you to get, to get up to this is, like, what is electric charge? And is, is there any, are there any subtleties about electric charge? Like, it's got more than, there's positive and negative, yes. So there's a subtlety. And how do you accumulate some on yourself you know, what is it about walking across carpet that does that? So that's, that's the story I've got to tell you. So let me start the story with, with uh, these little, let's see, I actually want to start with no electric charge here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send the camera so that it looks at this. At that little box I've got there, uh, preset one. And you, so you see the little, the little ball there. It's, you know, it's, it's known, I don't, it's, a, it's a pith ball. It's got a, it's got a, a metallic coating on a piece of very, you know, essentially light cork. And it's just hanging there on string. And the string is electrically insulating, which is in our future. But that's the basic, basic issue, is that, that that ball is, it has a mass. It's, it's got a weight. It's being held down by gravity, everything we've encountered before. But I'm going to put something different on it. I am going to put electric charge on it. And I will do that with. A, a, I've got a stick here. It happens to be a stick made of Teflon. And I will wipe the Teflon along a piece of silk. We'll talk more about what, what I just did in the near future. And I'm going to go in there to that little ball and, and touch it. And look what's going on now. 
the ball now seems to hate the stick. The Teflon stick and the ball are worst enemies. As I, as I go in there and push the stick nearby, the, the pith ball is doing everything it can to get away. So I evidently accumulated something on the surface of this Teflon, which I transferred in part to the little pith ball. And once that happened, those two objects, the stick and the pith ball, push apart like crazy. So they repel each other, just the, the, in the, the language of, that, of forces. They exert, they exert forces on each other in, op, in op, opposite directions. And those forces get stronger as you get closer. So they're, they're forces that are related to distance in a way that they get stronger as you get closer. OK? So what did I transfer? You got to give it a name. So I transferred charge or something like charge. I, somehow I had, I had charge on this stick, and I gave it in part to that pith ball. Char <clears throat> charge is our fourth and I think final conserved quantity of nature for the semester. Again, very rare things. Uh, electric charge is conserved. I couldn't create it out of nowhere. I got it off the silk onto the stick. I moved it from the stick onto the pith ball. Um, I'm going to take it off the pith ball with my hand because I can't, if I can. There we go. Okay. I've taken it off. And so it's gone. And now I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm not going to use the piece of Teflon. I'm going to use a piece of acrylic. And I'm not going to rub it with silk. I'm going to rub it actually with Teflon. It's a little bit of a crazy situation. But OK, I, I'm going to claim I've got something on the surface of this piece of acrylic. And I'm going to transfer it to the pith ball. And having done that, oh, the pith ball, again, it hates, it hates being near the acrylic. Get away, get away. OK. So I, I, it looks like I did exactly the same thing. Nothing changed. OK. Um, what if I take, go back to the original stick now, and I'll, I'll get the original stuff. There it is. You can see it, right? All sprinkled there. And instead of going directly in there with it to, to that, that pith ball there, I'm going to apply it to this little pith ball here. Okay, there you can see it now. Okay. okay, so I've sprinkled it on there. And now, if, if what I had on those two sticks was the same, these two pith balls should push apart, hate each other. Let's see whether that's the case. It's not. They pull together. You, presumably you saw that. It, it was very brief. I can do it again, so make sure everybody's convinced. I'll put the stuff off the acrylic on this ball in here. Ah, go away, go away. OK. I'll put the stuff off the Teflon stick on, the, on this pith ball. And now as I bring them together, do they repel? If, if they had the same stuff on them, they would repel. But no, they attract. And once they touch, then they don't care about each other anymore. They're indifferent. So the story, you know, what, what, what happened? What's going on here? The observation is there seem to be two types of this charged stuff. The, the Teflon stick accumulated one type. The acrylic stick accumulated another type. There are two. And the observation is that whatever type you've got, if you, have, if you parcel it out among two objects, they repel. They hate each other. But if you take the two different types and bring them near each other, they attract. So it's attractive. And to, to make the long story short, what we've done, and this is in, due in, in, in part to, to uh, Benjamin Franklin, is we named those two types positive and negative, just like, like, like the mathematical positive numbers, negative numbers. And so po positive charge is the stuff that accumulated on the acrylic. And for, for historical reasons having to do with Benjamin Franklin, this stuff was call, is called positive charge. I mean, I have no choice in it. This is, it is what it is. That's positive charge. 
this accumulated negative charge. And after some more scrutiny and checking, people figured out not only do we have two types, but they are actually two different uh, amounts of the same physical quantity, just charge. On this stick, there is a positive amount of that stuff, of that conserved quantity. On this stick, there's a negative amount of that stuff. And just as like we, we've seen that you can have positive and negative amounts of momentum, a positive amount of momentum to the right it means you move rightward. A negative amount of momentum to the right means you move back, you move the other way. With charge, the same thing. You, you accumulate less than no, no positive charge, you've got negative charge. It's just a continuous uh, range of possibilities. All right? Well, where, you know, why is there charge? Because it's, it, it's, just, it's, it's there in our, in our universe. It's there for us to find and play with. Uh, we, again, no choice in it. It's not a, uh, it's because, it's like, it's like, why is there a universe? Okay, because, why is there electric charge in our universe? Because, uh, electric charge has nothing directly to do with mass. So unlike gravity, which amazingly enough uh, creates weights that depend on mass, uh, electric charge doesn't depend on mass. You can have a very massive object with no charge, and you can have a, a, a very tiny, low-mass object with a lot of charge. It's just, it comes along with certain subatomic particles. Other details about charge are that electric charge, uh, you can't have an arbitrarily small amount of electric charge. It comes in units, in, in, in doses, in quanta. And the smallest amount of electric charge that is observed in nature is the electric charge on a single proton, you know, the, the subatomic particle known as a proton that's part of the nucleus of every atom. Um, one proton carries with it one fundamental unit of electric charge, and no one has ever seen in isolation any piece of charge smaller than that. And there are good reason to believe that, they're, that they don't exist. So a proton has one unit of electric charge, uh, it turns out an electron also has one unit of electric charge, but negative. So the, so the famous electrons that make up the outsides of atoms and are uh, contributing to, to, to chemistry and actually carry electricity through wires, they carry negative charge with them. And that dates to, 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 to Benjamin Franklin's choice. I mean, he basically was playing around with, with objects, rubbing them against each other and deciding one, you know, which one was he was going to call positive, which one was he going to call negative, and he made an unfortunate choice of choosing the one that was decorated with, uh, not with electrons. He called that one positive. It would, have been, it would have been so much nicer if he chose the one that was decorated with electrons and called it positive, because then electrons would be positively charged, but they're not. By long-standing convention, they're, called ne they're given negative charge. All right, so where things stand at the moment is the world has objects that, that, that can have electric charge on them. They can have positive amounts, they can have negative amounts, and they exert, the charges exert forces on charges. So if you've got two positive charges, they repel each other. If you have two negative charges, they repel each other. And if you have one of each, they attract each other. And those forces get stronger as you get closer. Um, that, those relationships of attraction, repulsion, and, and distance are, are known as Coulomb's Law, and they're, I'll, I'll leave that in the book, okay? I, don't, I won't dwell on Coulomb's Law, but it tells you how, how strong the forces are between various amounts of charges, positive, negative, distance, and so on. All right, well, so where does charge come from? Well, it's just there on, on some, certain subatomic particles. Electrons just have it. Uh, negative, of course, and protons just have it, positive. Well, that means that since we're made up of electrons and, and, and protons and other things, we must have electric charge all over the place in us. And the answer is that's true. But typically, we and other objects have no overall charge, zero net charge. Why? It's because we have as many positively charged widgies in, inside us as negatively charged ones. And if we didn't, 
we would attract the opposite one until we, did, until, until we hit zero, until we hit net zero. So, so I mean, suppose I've got w one of these balls, I'll, I'll, I'll decorate that ball in there with positive charge like this. Now it's all covered with positive charge. Should start hating this stick. Oh, uh, ah, I used the wrong, the wrong surface to rub against. We'll do more, talk more about rubbing soon. Now, yeah, oh, it got stuck to the wall, um, which is all, itself an interesting. I'm gonna, so they, they hate each other. That thing's covered with positive charge. If I leave it there for a week, it's going to be back to zero. Why? Because it is extremely attractive to any nearby negative charge that happens to be wandering around in the air. And th there are charged widgets in the air floating around. Um, I'll, I'll deal with why they're there another day. But they will, the, the negatively charged ones will love to go to that and stick. And there, any positive charged ones floating around will be repelled and won't go there. So this, this is a magnet for, for, for negative charges. And, and it will keep pulling them in until it goes to zero. And that's the state of affairs for most things. Most stuff is, is net charge zero, give or take a little bit. Uh, you can see that, there, that the charge is there in, in objects in an interesting way. I'm going to take the orange balloon, OK? And I am going to decorate it with negative charge using the traditional method. I, ha I happen to know it's negative charge. We could prove it with that ball and stuff like that. OK, so it's all covered with negative charge. Let me, let me go back so I can, the world can see this. Do, 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 do. OK, covered with negative charge and Oh, come on, you can do it. Is it not going to stick on this? No. Disappointment city. OK, I'll go over here. So why'd that happen? That balloon is covered with negative charge. And the wall was electrically neutral. That is, it has no net charge. It has lots of positive charges in it and lots of negative charges in it. What the balloon did, but they summed to zero. What the balloon did was it, it coaxed, because it's negatively charged, it coaxed all the positive charges in the wall to move a little closer to the balloon, because they're, they're being attracted. And all the negative charges are being moved a little away from the balloon, because they're repelled. So what the, what the balloon has done, the negatively charged balloon has done, is it has polarized the wall. It has taken the wall, which has no net charge, but has many individual charges, and uh, moved them up slightly apart. And we're talking atomic distances, subatomic distances. Tiny, tiny movement. But we now have the attraction now between the wall's positively charged particles, which have moved closer, is a little stronger now, because distance matters. And the forces get stronger with this, as you get closer. And the negative charges in the wall have been shoved a little farther away, so their repulsion is a little weaker. And that tiny sh shift between a slightly boosted attraction and a slightly reduced repulsion leads to a net, repulsion, a net attraction. The balloon is attracted to the wall that it has. The, wall, the balloon polarizes the wall and uh, is attracted to the, to the result. You okay with the idea? You know, where would this ever matter? Um, the, the El Cheapo versions of, of devices for cleaning the room air. The, people sell negative ion generators or positive ion generators, ion generators for your house. They boost wellness, which is probably you know, hooey, you know, whatever. Okay, fine, you can put crystals around if you like. But, but having electrically charged stuff floating around your air has, a, has a, an interesting consequence. The electrically charged charges that, that, that have been sprinkled in the air love to go and stick on dust particles for this very reason. They polarize the dust particle and then get attracted to it. So they stick on the dust particle or smoke particles. So all those smoke particles and dust particles pick up the electric charges that were sprinkled into the air. And those dust particles now go and polarize the walls and stick to the walls. So it cleans the room air 
by sticking all the crud that's in the room air to the walls. So if you want to paint your walls with crud, this is a good way to do it. Yeah, the room air will be clean, the walls will be dirty. You okay with that? All right, so as not to, you know, I've given you a fairly good basis for, for static electricity. What I haven't talked about is, is sort of how you end up, how did I end up getting negative charge on this stick, which I'll do, I'll, which I'll do on Monday. But instead I want to go and, and take a look at what happens if you accumulate a whole lot of static electricity. I don't need to have this up there, do I? Um, a whole lot of static electricity. Yeah. Uh, on, on one surface. As you accumulate charge, like as, as I'm here playing with these sticks and putting more and more charge on a certain surface, it takes energy to do that. I have to do work. To, if, I, if I, here's positive charge again. If I collect some more positive charge, I think I had positive charge on that guy. If I want to bring more positive charge there, I have to push. I'm, I have to force the stick against that ball. Now it's, it's stuck to the wall, right? It polarized the, the box and stuck. Usual, usual problem. But there's work done in accumulating more and more static electric charges together. And if you look at how much energy stored, it's, it's a potential energy, it's energy stored in the forces between the charges. If you pile a whole lot of positive charge, for example, all close together, it's got a lot of energy overall. It hates this. You keep shoving new ones in. It's chock full of electrostatic potential energy. And if you look at how much electrostatic energy there is, per portion of charge, per unit of electric charge. Electric charge has units, like most other things in, 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 the, in physics. And the unit is known as the Coulomb. If you keep packing Coulombs and Coulombs of charge together, you get a lot of energy. And it's a lot of energy per Coulomb of charge you've got. And there, there is a name for, the, for our quantity called the, the electrostatic potential energy per Coulomb. It's a familiar name. It's called the volt. So what voltage is? is how much energy each portion of charge has in a certain location. And we're going to pack a whole boatload of energy into a, a, a lot of charge in one location, and it's going to have a lot of energy per unit of charge. Huge voltage. And to do that, we have to you know, go to a gadget to do it. So this gadget is known as a Von de Graaff generator. It's, there's a rubber belt in there that's carrying like charges, the same charge, always more and more and more to this ball, and a whole lot of them pile up here to the point where they are really packed tight up there. There's a lot of energy grand total, electrostatic potential energy there grand total, and the energy per charge is enormous. It's got an enormous voltage. It happens to be negative, which is just a nuisance. But it's so big that this is charge the spark you, you, you can see in here is between my knuckle and the, and the ball. The one you don't notice is the one between my, my little toe of my right foot and the floor. <laughs> Woo! Okay, so huge voltage. And you can do interesting things when you've got that much electric charge together. For example, you know, go who's. It's, What's happening is the electric charge is accumulating not only on the ball, but on the pom-pom, each little frond of the pom-pom, and they are repelling each other like crazy. And if I take the charge off, the repulsion mostly goes away. And here's styrofoam peanuts, same idea. Woo! All right. And of course, the most fun is hair. So let me start with this. Here, here's the, here's the, the deal. There's no charge accumulating there right now because I'm, I'm letting all of it come off and go into the ground. But when I take the stick away, it will start to accumulate. And I'm going to stand on top of this insulating um, stool so the net charge on me can be anything it wants. I'm so isolated, I can have lots of charge. And I'm going to collect now a whole lot of charge off the ball. And is my hair going, doing anything? Yeah, no. It's completely unpredictable whose hair and, and whether my hair you know, um, will stand up. It's, it's you know, whether you have product in or no product. Could I have a volunteer or two or three to come try? Come on down. Yeah, yeah. 
And the, the idea is I, I can do this without, without giving you guys sh shocks. Um, but I, what I'll do is I will take all the charge off the ball, stand on the stool, put your hand on the ball, on the big ball, and right now, no charge, I'll let it accumulate. And don't, once I let it accumulate, don't take your hand off the ball, just, just let it stay there. You may feel things sparkle and, and crackle. Do you feel any crackly feelings? Give your hair, hair a little shake. We're, I, we're, can we get any? It's, it's getting a little, a little, a little fluffy in the, in the back. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the back's starting to go. Yeah, when I don't have a, yeah, I don't have any. Okay, yeah, you, you, when you, yeah, when, that's the right way to finish it, is to take your hand off and step on the ground, the charge goes out through your feet. Uh, yeah, yeah, come on up and try. And try. Okay, you put your hand on the ball. Okay, now I'll let, I'll let the charge start to accumulate on you. Oh, yeah, 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 and don't reach over to the box. You want to not, give your hair, hair a little bit of shake. Yeah, in, the, in the back, the hair in, 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 in the back is starting to, is, is. <laughs> Okay, step back. All right. You, you all can, at your leisure, can come up here and we can try this more with other people. Uh, once in a while we'll get someone that'll have their hair stand up like a dandelion. <laughs>